Zombie Science, Part 3. We've been going through a book by Jonathan Wells called Zombie Science, More Icons of Evolution, which is a follow-up of Jonathan Wells' uh, book in 2000, Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth. Um, the cover looks like this. And um, the, uh, we're in chapter three. Um, chapter one was Who Let the Zombies Out, which are introductory remarks, including about science, evolution, and trusting scientists, which um, parallel uh, the book by Chris Roop and uh, John Sanford. The next um, comment is about the tree of life. The next chapter is about the tree of life. Uh, thinking about the uh, putting uh, all animals and plants and uh, bacteria into some kind of a genealogical uh, setting. And the tree of life and homology, which are, is related to the tree of life, are two of the icons of evolution that have become part of zombie science. Uh, then uh, in chapter three, which we're in part two of that. Uh, part one discusses the Miller-Urey apparatus. That's the origin of life, Heckel's embryos, Archaeopteryx, and peppered moths. And you notice that all of these are not just theories, stories, and so forth. They're also pictures. And that's why they're called icons of evolution, because you actually have images. Um, and now we're in part two of chapter three and we're gonna discuss Darwin's finches. When Charles Darwin visited the Galapagos Islands aboard the British survey ship HMS Beagle in 1835, he collected specimens of the local wildlife. These included some finches that he threw into bags, many of them mislabeled. Although the Galapagos finches had little impact on Darwin's thinking, biologists who studied them a century later called them Darwin's finches and invented the myth that Darwin had correlated differences in finches' beaks with different food sources. He hadn't. Uh, according to the myth, Darwin was inspired by the finches to formulate his theory of evolution, although according to historian of science Frank Soloway, nothing could be further from the truth. In other words, this is the this is a creation of the creation myths creation. In the 1970s, biologists Peter and Rosemary Grant and their colleagues camped out on one of the Galapagos Islands called Daphne Major and studied one finch species, the medium ground finch, in great detail. In 1977, a severe drought left only hard to crack seeds and about 85% of the birds died. Those that survived had beaks that were on average 5% bigger, and their offspring also tended to have larger beaks. The Grants had documented an example of natural selection. Of course, no individual birds had changed, only the average beak size among the survivors. Nevertheless, Peter Grant estimated that if there were more droughts and the average beak size continued to increase, which maybe it could, maybe it couldn't, natural selection could eventually produce a species of finch. In a 1991 article in Scientific American, he wrote, if droughts occurred um, once a decade on average, repeated directional selection at this rate with no selection in between droughts would transform one species into another within 200 years. Using the same reasoning, the authors of a 1999 pro-evolution booklet from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences called Darwin's finches a particularly compelling example of speciation. The same claim could be found in many biology textbooks at the time, along with the myth that the finches had played an important role in the formulation of Darwin's theory. After the drought ended, however, birds with smaller beaks thrived again, and the average beak size returned to its previous level. No net evolution had occurred, and that's not the only problem with the finch icon. Evidence for interbreeding the finch icon is all about speciation. Animals are generally considered to belong to the same species if they can interbreed and produce robust offspring. A green ellipses are mine. Uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing because we don't have time, but um, I'm trying to do kind of a Reader's Digest 
uh, production of this. And it looks like I, these, I should have put those in green as well. By the 1990s, the Grants and their colleagues had observed that several of the Galapagos finch species were interbreeding and producing offspring that were more fit than their parents. But Darwin's finches are supposed to be an icon of adaptive radiation in which species first split from a common ancestor and then become increasingly dif different over time. So, yeah. Uh, and, um, Let's see, Fig see figure 2.2, if those of you who are curious, figure 2.2 is the branching, the only figure in Darwin's origin of species. By, in 1981, a large male finch arrived on Daphne Major from a nearby island. Grants nicknamed it Big Bird, and genetic testing showed that it was a hybrid. It mated with several medium ground finch females and produced fertile offspring that were larger than other medium ground finches, had a distinctive song, and kept to themselves. In 2009, the grants reported that this hybrid population was reproductively isolated from the other finches on the island, and therefore supported some expectations of a particular theory of speciation. In 2015, the grants and a team of scientists reported that they had sequenced the genomes of all the species of Darwin finches. They found extensive evidence for interspecific gene flow through the, throughout the radiation. Apparently, the Galapagos finches had been interbreeding ever since they arrived there. The team even cited several examples in which species A and species B on the island X are genetically more similar to each other than species A on island X is to species A on island Y. In other words, species is a confused concept in this particular area, or at least it's being used in a confusing way. Skipping over a few other things, in 2015, uh, biologists Bailey McKay and Robert Zink wrote that ground finches on the Galapagos Islands cy cycle between stages of differentiation and never attain species status, a process we refer to as Sisyphean evolution which has been confused with the standard model of speciation. Sisyphus is doomed to push a, a rock up to the top of a hill. As soon as he gets there, it rolls back down and he has to turn right around and push it back up again. Nothing that is happening. The textbooks. Remember, we've had all these problems. They're not really species in the true sense of the word. They can interbreed and so forth. Despite all these problems, many biology textbooks still feature Darwin's finches as an icon of evolution. After describing the Grant's research, Miller and Levine's 2014, remember this is recent, this is after icons of evolution has come out criticizing this icon, concludes that average beak size in this finch population has increased dramatically. Uh, those are their ellipses, by the way, or his ellipses, I think. Changes in food supply created selection pressures that caused finch population to evolve within decades. Not a word about how the increase in average beak size disappeared after the drought ended, and not a word about evidence that different, the different finch species interbreed to produce robust hybrids. The 2014 of Raven and Johnson's biology did something similar. In the interest of time, if you're interested, I'm going to suggest you read the book. Four ring fruit flies. Normal fruit flies have two wings. Behind each wing is a tiny balancer that vibrates rapidly during flight to stabilize the fly's movements. In the 1970s, geneticist Edward Lewis discovered that by artificially combining three separate DNA mutations in a fruit fly embryo, he could transform the balancers into a second pair of normal looking wings. But the mutant four-wing fruit fly lost its balancers in the bargain. Worse, the mutant wings do not have any flight muscles. So the four-wing fly has great difficulty flying and mating, and it cannot survive for long outside the laboratory. It is a sideshow freak, an evolutionary dead end. Yet some textbooks in 2000 featured photos of four-wing fruit flies, and some continue to do so. For example, Freeman's 2014 Biological Science, I should have italicized that, includes a photo of the four-ring fly accompanied by text stating that mutations can turn a segment in the, middle of a, in the middle part of the body into a segment just like the one that lies in front of it. 
which it can, sort of, except that there are no muscles on that. So instead of having balancers, the transformed segment now bears a pair of wings. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Except that we just learned it can't fly. No mention of the fact that the mutant wings are effectively dead or that the fly is severely handicapped. Turning a shrimp into a fly. So what's happened is now we're pushing beyond this. The gene Lewis mutated to make four-ring fruit flies was ultrabithorax, abbreviated UBX. In 2002, a press release from the University of California at San Diego announced that biologist William McGinnis and his colleagues had discovered how UBX mutations supposedly allowed aquatic shrimp-like animals with limbs on every segment of their bodies to evolve 400 million years ago into a radically different body plan, the terrestrial six-legged insects. The news release boasted that this was a landmark in evolutionary biology, not only because it shows how new animal body plans could arise from a simple genetic mutation, but because it effectively answers a major criticism creationists have long leveled against evolution, the absence of a genetic mechanism that could permit animals to introduce radical new body designs. I want you to notice something on the quote. What it does is enable them to answer a, a, a major criticism creationists had long leveled against evolution, apparently with some success. The absence of a genetic mechanism, see? Now we've found the mechanism. This is the same kind of thing you see with um, uh, with the, uh, you know, we now found the missing link. It tells you that they didn't find the missing link before. Well, how good is this? What did McGinnis and his colleagues actually show? Shrimp embryos contain a version of the UBX protein that does not inhibit leg formation, while a fruit fly embryo contains no UBX protein in its thorax from which its legs and wings develop but does contain a version of the UBX protein in its abdomen that inhibits leg formation there. McGinnis and his colleagues showed that when UBX from the abdomen of a fruit fly is inserted into the thorax of a fruit fly embryo, leg development is inhibited. But when UBX from a shrimp abdomen is inserted into the same location, a fruit fly embryo develops fruit, fruit fly uh, leg rudiments. They speculated that the UBX gene in a shrimp-like ancestor might have mutated into the fruit fly version that now suppresses leg development but is not expressed in the thorax. Now what I'd really like to know is what is the difference between those two UBX proteins? And is it within reach of uh, mutations? I have my doubts, but it would be interesting to find out for sure. Yet McGinnis and his colleagues did not reduce the number of legs in a shrimp, which is supposedly uh, what supposedly happened in the course of evolution. And of course it would have taken a lot more than the loss of some legs to change a fr shrimp into a fruit fly. So despite the hype, the experiment did not come close to showing how new animal body plants could arise from a, single, a simple genetic mutation. I mean, if there are, let's say, two um, mutations that will convert a, a shrimp UBX into a uh, insect UBX, uh, then I would buy a simple genetic mutation. But if there are, you know, 200, that's not simple. 18 wing dragonflies, so what happens is that at a certain point you start really taking off. UBX is one of a family of genes called Hox genes, which affect head to tail development. In 2007, Donald Prothero published a book defending evolution. The book included a photo of a four winged fruit fly, the icon, <coughs> to illustrate how big developmental changes can result from small genetic mutations. 
The book also claimed that modern four-winged dragonflies evolved from ancient dragonflies that had more wings, and it featured a drawing of an 18-winged dragonfly together with a four-winged dragonfly. Now, by the way, Donald Prothero, as I recall, is a, uh, a paleontologist, not a uh, uh, not a biologist, but and um, uh, in a debate with uh, uh, intelligent divine, design advocates, I believe it's Stephen Meyer and Richard Sternberg. According to Prothero, apparently having forgotten the number of wings in his drawing, the text clearly, this is the text that he just, we just got through reading about, clearly points out that the 12 wing dragonfly is a thought experiment, an illustration to show that a simple change in Hawk's genes allows the arthropods to make huge evolutionary changes by simple modification of regulatory genes. But the text in Prothero's book did not identify the 18-wing dragonfly as a thought experiment. Instead, it stated experiments have shown that a few Hox genes cause arthropods to add or subtract segments, and other Hox genes can produce whatever appendage is needed. Thus, the macroevolutionary transition from one body form to another with a completely different number of segments and appendages is a very easy process. That sounds like a thought experiment, but anyway. In 2013, so this is after these controversies, Prothera published another book, Bringing Fossils to Life. The book reproduced the 2007 drawing of an 18-winged dragonfly with a caption that stated, watch this, fossils demonstrate that many earth early arthropods were capable of adding or losing wings or other appendages. This cartoon of real fossils, this cartoon of real fossils, 18 winged dragonfly, shows how this multiplication or reduction process can rapidly produce entirely new body forms from a single mutant, uh, Hox mutant, according to um, Jonathan Wells. So in 2019, the 18 winged dragonfly was an imaginary thought experiment, but in four years, it evolved into a real fossil. Isn't zombie science amazing? Fossil horses, um, he doesn't say much about it, and I'm going to omit most of it because most the pride of place once held by fossil horses is now held by fossil whales, which we shall examine in Chapter 5. That will be uh, two weeks from today. A to human... Darwin did not deal with human evolution in the origin of species other than to predict that on the foundation of his theory, light will be thrown on the origin of man in his history. Twelve years later, in The Descent of Man, he wrote that man is descended from some lower form by the same materialistic process of variation and natural selection that gave rise to all other forms of life. Since Darwin's time, many more fossils have been discovered, and the term hominid was coined to include all living and extinct apes, humans, and extinct ape-like animals believed to be ancestral humans. But no consistent picture of human evolution has emerged. Skipping over a couple of paragraphs, the framework for these pre-existing narratives is the grand materialistic story, starting with the spontaneous origin of life from inanimate chemicals and culminating in the evolution of humans from other animals by unguided natural processes. Using fossils to illustrate the story, it tells the story of Ida, who wasn't even a hominid in the strict sense. Um, and then Ardi, and Sidiba, and uh, Naledi, and um, those of you who are here for uh, the uh, Contested Bones uh, series, um, have far more detail than what he gives in his. Um, um, basically, he's condensed uh, that uh, material down, uh, or some of that material down. Um, and then 99% chimp. When the Homo naledi fossils were discovered, a writer for National Geographic magazine asked, why are the scientists certain that human evolution happened? The first reason she gave was that we share nearly 99% of our genetic sequence with chimpanzees. 
but do we? In 2005, the Chimpanzee Sequencing and Analysis Consortium found that at the level of single subunit, the two genomes were 98.77% similar. I'd take that for 99%, though that figure excluded many deleted or inserted sequences. So, yeah, if you cherry pick your data enough, you can find they're similar. Scientists who compared chimp and human DNA at the level of protein coding sequences instead of the single subunits concluded that the two genomes are more, no more than 93.6% similar. Well, that's a little bit less. And uh, the hype over what, uh, whatever the percent is similar between chimp and human DNA is just another chapter in the grand materialistic story. Now, at this point, before we go on, I'll just mention that he missed probably the most interesting story yet, and that's the story of the human and chimp white chromosomes, which are uh, just amazingly different. Multiplying zombies. All of the icons of evolution misrepresent the truth. The evidence does not justify the sweeping claims that are made in their name. They should be empirically dead to any informed rational observer, but they keep coming, back, uh, keep coming anyway. Textbooks still carry them, but textbooks are not the main problem. The main problem is the scientific establishment's determination to promote evolution in spite of the evidence. Thanks to zombie science, the ranks of the icons are swelling. If one icon of evolution is discredited, such as the horse uh, icon, others shuffle forward to take its place. The following five chapters describe six more icons of evolution that, like the first ten, have been used for years to support evolution. Some are old, some are relatively new, but as I will show, all six, like the first ten icons, misrepresent the evidence. In the process, they have seriously compromised the scientific enterprise in its search for truth. And now, one of those icons, DNA, the secret of life. Drawings of the DNA molecule have become a familiar part of our culture and not just in science textbooks. Like photos of Archaeopteryx fossils, the DNA drawings depict real evidence. But zombie science attributes far more significance to the DNA molecule than the evidence justifies. Like Archaeopteryx, DNA has become yet another illustration in the grand materialistic story, another icon of evolution. Skipping over from Darwin to DNA, uh, this is background and uh, it's fascinating stuff. I strongly suggest you read it if you have the time, but uh, we don't right now. From DNA to us, in 1958, Francis Crick proposed that the specificity of DNA segment lies solely in its nucleotide sequence, which encodes the nucleotide sequence of a molecule of RNA, which in turn serves as a template for the amino acid sequence of a protein. Crick also proposed that the information encoded in the DNA sequence can be transferred from DNA to protein, but not back again. He called the former the sequence hypothesis and the latter the central dogma of molecular biology. But central dogma is now commonly used to refer to the sequence hypothesis as well. Uh, Francois Jacob and uh, Jacques Monod dis uh, discovered what messenger RNA did. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because we're going to quote from both of them in just a bit so you know who he's quoting for. So DNA carries information that is encoded in the sequences of its four letter alphabet, the four bases. That information is transcribed into messenger RNAs, and those messenger RNAs are then translated into proteins by complex assemblies of proteins and RNAs called ribosomes. From a materialistic point of view, organisms are reducible to molecules. So the central dogma can be summarized as DNA makes RNA, makes protein, makes us. In 1970, Jacob, that's the Jacob we were just referring to, wrote that an organism is a realization of a genetic program written in DNA sequences. The same year, Monod said that with the central dogma and the understanding of the random physical basis of mutation that molecular biology has also provided, the mechanism of Darwinism is at last securely founded. And man has to understand that he is a mere accident. Interesting how 
you, you go from the mechanism to man has to serve, uh, understand that he is a mere accident. Um, the most extreme interpretation of the central dogma is that of British biologist Richard Dawkins. In 1976, Dawkins wrote that we and all other animals are machines created by our, our genes. DNA, he continued, is a set of instructions for how to make a body. And it makes a body in order to ensure its own survival. So the body is a survival machine for selfish genes. From pop gen to evo devo and epigenetics. In the 1930s, evolutionary theory was wedded to a new discipline called population genetics, or pop gen. Assuming that genes on chromosomes specify traits such as those studied by Mendel, the alternative forms of a gene that specify different forms of the same trait were called alleles. Population genetic studies that uh, the distribution of variant alleles in a group of organisms. They get more frequent, less frequent, and in what ways. Many people concluded that evolution could be reduced to population genetics. One biology textbook went so far as to say that evolution can be precisely defined as any change in the frequency of alleles within a gene pool from one generation to the next. What's wrong with this picture? Well, for one thing, you have to account for the arrival of those alleles. But not every evolutionist agreed. In 1963, Ernst Meyer called the approach of Haldane, Fisher, and Wright beanbag genetics because it treated genes as unconnected rather than interacting. Beanbag genetics is in many ways misleading, Meyer wrote, because an individual, the target of the selection, is not a mosaic of characters, each of which is the product of a given gene. Rather, than, rather genes are the are merely the units of the genetic program that governs the complicated process of development. In 2005, Sean B. Carroll echoed Meyer's criticism. In 1992, Australian-born Canadian biologist Brian K. Hill also echoed it. In particular, population genetics in, ignores embryo development. Evo Diva to the rescue? Evo Devo supplements ev evolutionary biology with developmental genetics. Starting with the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster in the 1970s and 80s, biologists had made great progress in understanding the genetics of embryo development. One of the most important and surprising discoveries was that very different organisms have similar developmental genes. For example, we saw in chapter three that shrimps and Fruit flies possess similar Hox genes, which affect development along the head to tail body axis. Similar Hox genes are found also in many other animals, including humans, mice, chicks, frogs, fish, sea urchins, octopuses, snails, earthworms, and roundworms. So, all kinds of animals. If animals have similar development of genes, why do they develop so differently? In 1990, Developmental biologist Eric Davidson used the terms gene regulatory networks to refer to sets of interacting DNA sequences, RNAs, and proteins that regulate transcription. And he argued that the significant features of early development have to do directly with the distribution in embryonic space of gene regulatory molecules. In other words, animals with similar underlying genes develop differently because of differences in where and when those genes are transcribed. According to Sean B. Carroll, animals that share similar toolkit genes have different genetic switches elsewhere in their DNA. Carroll wrote in 2005, with considerable exaggeration, that we now have a very firm grasp of how development is controlled. We can explain how toolkit proteins shape form, that toolkit genes are shared by all animals, and that differences in form arise from changing the way they are used. Interesting ideas, but how radical are they really? Davidson's gene regulatory networks and Carroll's genetic switches are encoded in DNA. So Davidson and Carroll actually remain wedded to the central dogma. For them, development and evolution are ultimately still about the DNA. Yet when Brian Hill proposed the term evolutionary developmental biology in 1992, he wrote that an understanding of the control of development and evolution will require determining how genetic, epigenetic, and environmental factors are integrated into a hierarchical set of unified controls. 
An understanding of the genome, important as that is, alone, will not provide the explanations that we seek. And then he talks about epigenetics. In, in Greek, epi means above, on, or ad in addition to. In 1942, British biologist Conrad Waddington introduced the word epigenetics to mean the study of the processes involved in the mechanisms by which the genes of the genotype bring about phenotypic effects. Three years earlier, however, Waddington had coined the word epigenotype to refer more broadly to the set of organizing relationships to which a certain piece of tissue will be subject during its development. From the beginning then, epigenetics had more than one meaning. In a narrow sense, it referred to the mechanisms by which genes produce phenotypic effects. In a broad sense, it referred to all of the factors involved in genetic in development only one of which is the genome. Most biologists now use epigenetics in its narrow sense to refer to heritable changes in the structure of a chromosome that do not change the underlying DNA sequence, such as methylation. But some biologists understand epigenetics more broadly. And again, there's a rich uh, commentary that I'm omitting in the interest of time, uh, but I suggest that those of you who want to dig more deeply Get the book and read it, it's worth it. Uh, epigenetics in this broader sense implies that there is much more to inheritance and development than DNA. Where does that leave the central dogma? The central dogma, according to Jonathan Wells, is dead. Historian of biology Jan Sapp has documented how gene-centered thinking became the dominant viewpoint in biology during the 20th century. And I say I missed putting up a uh, superscript. But evidence has accumulated that such a narrow view distorts reality. If makes is taken to mean fully specifies, then it turns out that G DNA does not make fully specify RNA. RNA does not make fully specify protein. And protein does not make fully specify us. Uh, he talks about alternative splicing and RNA editing which means that you pull out the RNA, you have to change it a little bit before it's actually going to be useful. Furthermore, although the function of a protein depends on its three-dimensional shape, its shape is not always specified by its amino acid sequence. And such things as chaperone proteins. Finally, most plants and animals' proteins are chemically modified by the addition of sugar molecules, and the modifications can change over time according to the needs of the organism. Again, that's my ellipsis. Uh, so the claim that DNA makes RNA makes protein is false, but it is the central dogma's final step, making us, that it fails most dramatically. The need for spatial information. In most cases, after RNA and proteins are synthesized, they must be transported to specific locations in a cell in order for them to function properly. In addition to their protein coding regions, some messenger RNAs have a sequence called a zip code that specifies the address in the cell where they are to be transported. But an RNA zip code, like a postal zip code, is meaningless unless it matches a pre-existing address, which means there have got to be addresses around, out there before any of this starts. Skipping over a few paragraphs, in many cases, membrane patterns are templated by the membranes from which they are derived in the course of cell division, with new proteins from the cell interior being incorporated into the existing pattern during membrane growth. So even if the individual molecules in a membrane pattern were completely specified by DNA, their spatial arrangement would not be. In other words, biological membranes carry essential spatial information, a membrane code, that cannot be reduced to information in DNA sequences. According to British biologist Thomas Cavalier-Smith, the idea that the genome contains all the information needed to make an organism is simply false. Membrane patterns play a key role in mechanisms that convert the linear information of DNA into the three-dimensional shape of single cells and multicellular organisms. Animal development creates a complex three-dimensional multicellular organism, not by starting from the linear information in DNA, but always starting from an already highly complex three-dimensional unicellular organism the fertilized egg. 
or the bacterial cell, for that matter. Uh, other critics of the central dogma, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, Giuseppe Sermonti, who discusses why is a fly not a horse. But if this fantastically sophisticated program is irreducible, if nothing less complex could do the job, then how could it have evolved to its present state by one mutation at a time, genetics or otherwise? Zombie science lumbers past this question without taking it seriously. Fruit flies with useless extra wings or missing legs have taught us something about developmental genetics, but nothing about how evolution might build new form and function. All of the evidence points to one conclusion. No matter what we do to the DNA of a fruit fly embryo, there are only three possible outcomes. A normal fruit fly, a defective fruit fly, or a dead fruit fly. Not even a horse fly much less a horse. Skipping on, apparently, however, many people in the news media and popular culture, and even some scientists, have not gotten the memo. Long live the central dogma. Despite the evidence against it, the central dogma lives on. American biologist Michael Lynch, while acknowledging that organisms are more than the sum of their parts, wrote in 2007, echoing Deb Hansky, uh, that since nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, nothing in evolution makes sense in, except in the light of population genetics. Not even Evo Diva, I guess. Not surprisingly, most biology textbooks continue to teach students that population genetics is the basis of, for evolution. Remember, population genetics can't produce anything new. You have to have mutations for that, and they have to be good enough mutations. In 2016, Richard Dawkins reaffirmed his belief in the centrality of genes. Obviously, we've, not, we've long known that some genes are turned on and other genes are not turned on in different tissues, he said. This is the trendy thing that gets all the hype and doesn't deserve to. Oh, that is kind of important. In this case, however, the trend is following the evidence. And yet, despite the evidence, some research in development of biology is still publicized as though it confirms the central dogma. A press release accompanied one 2015 study announced master orchestrator of the genome is discovered. Stem cell scientists report, new research shows how a single growth factor receptor protein programs the entire genome. An institute where another 2015 study was done announced its results with this headline. Scientists under, uncover gene architects responsible for body's blueprint. The announcements went on to say that researchers have identified two key proteins that act as genetic art, architects, creating the blueprint needed by embryos during the earliest stages of their development. The gene for X. And here we get to where it goes into the popular press and into the Supreme Court for what it's worth. Faith in the central dogma has misled many people into believing that we have genes for things such as specific anatomical features, diseases, and even behaviors. Of course, it's mutations in genes that cause some disease, not the genes themselves. Yet, single gene diseases such as Huntington's chorea, which killed Folksinger Woody Guthrie, cystic fibrosis, and hemophilia, affect relatively few people. Most diseases cannot be traced to mutations in a single gene. The so-called breast cancer genes of BRCA1 and BRCA2 have received a lot of attention because many women suffer from this disease at some point in their lives. According to the US National Cancer Institute, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations account for about 20 to 25 percent of hereditary breast cancers and about 5 to 10 percent of all breast cancers. So, Women with a family history of the disease are encouraged to get tested for their mutations. But the vast majority of breast cancer cases have no connection to BRCA1 or BRCA2, and the women with mutations in them may never have the disease. The gene is not enough. Uh, now, you might doubt that, but take a look. Five to 10% of all breast cancers, that means 95% come from something else.
Some of the silliest manifestations of GNA centrism have come from people who claim to have found the gene for some behavior. In 1993, geneticist Dean Hamer and his colleagues have claimed to discover the gene for male homosexuality. Hamer called it the gay gene. The same year, three geneticists wrote to science that Hamer's results were statistically insignificant and in any case were not consistent with any genetic model. A 1999 study published in Science did not support Hamer's claim, while a 2014 study published in Psychological Medicine did. When a researcher from the University of California at Los Angeles reported in 2015 that certain chromosomal patterns were 70% correlated with sexual orientation in male twins, not 100% notice, geneticist John Greeley criticized the researcher's method and called the results uninterpretable. Science writer Ed Young wrote in The Atlantic that the research was fatally weak and emphasized that scientists have not found the gay gene. Other researchers have claimed to find genes for alcoholism, violence, IQ, schizophrenia, gambling, sadness, and political views, among other things. In 2004, Hamer published a book titled The God Gene, How Faith is Hardwired into Our Genes. And again, that's a superscript. John Horgan, formerly a senior writer for Scientific American, has called this gene whiz science. Um, and I would have to agree. But Horgan explained that the methodology of behavioral geneticists is highly susceptible to false positives. Researchers select a group of people who share a trait and then start searching for a gene that occurs not universally and exclusively, but simply more often in this group than in a control group. If you look at enough genes, you will almost inevitably find one that meets these criteria simply through chance. In fact, to be precise, the chance is one in 20 for every gene that you look at. That's what statistical significance means. Yet follow-up studies that failed to corroborate the initial claim received much less or no attention, leaving the public with the mistaken impression that the initial report was accurate, and more broadly, the genes determine who we are. So the central dogma continues to mislead scientists and non-scientists alike. True, some GNA sequences encode some RNAs, and some RNA sequences encode proteins, but in general, this, the central dogma is false. DNA does not contain the genetic program for an organism, and DNA is far from being the secret of life. Continued faith in it is rooted in materialism. The fault doesn't lie with our genes, but with zombie science. Now, that completes chapter four. I think Wells makes a good case, the Darwin's finches, four-winged fruit flies, the horse series, and the ape to human series, although attractive icons, do not accord with the facts well enough to support neo-Darwinian evolution and could be considered scientifically dead. He notes that they still survive in textbooks like zombies that continue to walk while being dead. His argument on the central dogma, his arguments on the central dogma are understated at one point. In the case of antibody producing cells, some lymphocytes, the DNA is actually altered so that protein does make new DNA in humans. And most other animals. It is slightly oversold in that, while not all DNA makes RNA, most RNA is produced originally by transcription of DNA, and the vast majority of protein owes the vast majority of its structure to RNA, and thus to the original DNA structure. Also, even his proposed and well-defended additional sources of information are dependent at present on material, and thus compatible with a materialistic story at present. The origin of information may very well be from intelligence, while it's playing out in a cell could be mechanistic. I think Wells is continuing to add to his case that the simplifications are that are made in textbooks and popular articles are slanted towards the indoctrination of students into a totally materialistic story and that the facts don't support the simplifications, and that particularly the use to which these simplifications are put 
are not supported by the facts. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment over here. Looks like we're going to have to run the mic a little bit. fascinating this morning. Uh, obviously having taught biology and molecular biology, etc. to students, uh, these thoughts are part of what we have to deal with. Uh, I, this brings, brings a, a, a number of comments since we've, uh, we've worked through these issues with many, many students. Um, one of the most interesting, uh, and I came in just a little wait, uh, late, so maybe you've already dealt with what I wanted to comment on first, and that is the Nobel Prize winning research, which has been focused on uh, a single gene called Antenopedia, where a single mutation in a regulatory gene can transform the antenna of a, an insect to, the, to a leg. Um, I really thought we had moved beyond the point of using that as a substantiation for mega evolution. And by we, I mean the scientific community. The four-winged fruit flies still appear periodically. Of course. But the, there's a point that is missed in using an evolutionary argument, and that is uh, evolution only occurs when gene, uh, I'm sorry, changes in the, uh, the number of individuals that express a particular gene only occurs when that gene is expressed. In other words, you can't select for genes whose expression is covered up by a regulatory gene. Mm -hmm. the, the effect of, of antennapedia, I said, as I said, is dramatic. You see an insect with a leg growing out of its head. But the only way these can be done is that they have to be expressed apart from the role of the regulatory gene that it suppresses their expression. And so we have insects uh, uh, which have different uh, appendages at different places in the body, and it's a major story in differentiation in species. Uh, I'm making this longer than I meant to. In other words, these is somewhere along for the evolutionary story to be right, we had to have uh, insects with antennae, for example, at every segment. Or legs at every segment. Yes. And then a mutation. But of both, of, both of which are non-functional. Right. In other words, it's impossible to use a mutation in a Hox gene, uh, with, that's the term for the regulatory genes, as a basis for evolution, because if that were the only evolution, then there would be nothing underlying to change expression. So you would, you would have to have choice between uh, different appendages, but they'd have to pretty much be expressed over the whole insect's body. Otherwise, how could you get a leg from a site which normally produces an antenna without all of the regular, uh, without all structural genes being present in the, the uh, embryonic source tissue? for what normally gives a, uh, an antenna. And that argument is so obviously flawed, I, I was really kind of blown away, and I came in just before you got to it, that they're using this as a way to show that big changes can occur. Sure they can, if long as there is a underlying 
series of possibil possibilities of how expression will occur at each point in the body. Yeah. And uh, your, your ultrabithorax is uh, another example. Most insects have four pairs, uh, have two pairs of wings, or four wings. That's supposedly the primitive pattern. Drosophila and other flies suppress mm -hmm. that expression in the second segment that produces and produce a very small structure that they can't fly without called the halteer. Yeah, if you clip it off, they fly around in circles or they, or they well, fly they're, they're, random. Well, their uh, lifespan will be quite limited because they bump into everything because they can no longer control yeah. how they use their wings to fly in a particular direction. So in other words, those things are useful. Yes the, yes, the halt here is the only way an insect can decide whether it's flying like this or like this or like that. And uh, of interest, uh, the four-wing fruit flies can't fly. They, I mean, they're, they're basically, they behave like uh, flies whose halt ears have been cl cut off. Yeah, well, there's... <laughs> The, what's lacking is the nervous system program to coordinate those f two sets of wings in fruit flies. Well, apparently the muscles as well are gone. Without the muscles, the uh, nervous system doesn't do you much good. Yeah, but the, uh, for the, but for the, the muscles, do, muscles don't have to be different here and here. They can still be, be the same yeah. source. But the idea is that in order to use a new appendage, you have to, I mean, if, if it's going to be locomotory wings or legs, you have to have not only the appendage, but then you have to have the muscles that, that remove Oh, precisely. It, that's all part, of, have the, that's all have part the, of the gene expression. I didn't understand yeah, where you were going yeah. with that. And then sure. you have to have the nervous system to control when yeah, the muscles are being used. Yes, this, the same regulatory gene has to control muscle uh, expression of muscle development or a suite of genes involved exactly. would certainly have to do all of that. Yeah. And the musculature in the leg of an insect is uh, very simple simple until you look at it carefully, and it's very complex. Yeah, and then the control is the same way. It looks simple until um, you get into the details. And I, I'll quit with this comment at this point, but uh, there are some insects that are so small uh, you you need a microscope to see them, that a leg muscle will be one muscle cell. Now, how do you control the varying degrees of contraction? Well, there's a whole mechanism in control of insect muscle, which gives the ability to variably contract a single muscle cell rather than all or nothing. It, it must, insect muscles simply don't contract as all or nothing, all or nothing or these small insects couldn't exist. You know, you just think of how we would have to design it, how difficult it would be, and then you have people who say, but you know, you just toss enough genes up in the air and sooner or later something will happen. On the other hand, uh, I wasn't, I'm not totally comfortable with uh, the take you indicated for this book on uh, population genetics, it's real. Oh, it is real, except for one thing. Population genetics will sort among a suite of genes. That are expressed. That are already there. Of In course. order to be expressed, they have to be already there. Well, they can, it can also select for new combinations that are somehow yeah. expressed. But the actual creation is done by mutation. It is not done by natural selection. Natural selection is basically saying these of course. These ones live, these ones die, or at least they don't. Natural leave. selection simply chooses express the effects of expressed genes. What's already there. And, and changes their frequency in the population. Yeah. But it's, it's a very useful concept. Oh, it when is. When understood com well. Yeah. But it's kind of sounded to me like he was saying, ah, you can forget it. Well, it's, I mean, it's real, but like I say, it has to have raw material on yeah. which to work. Well, I don't mean this to uh, anyway. end up in a dialogue between us two, so let me be quiet. <laughs> no, just a couple of comments here. Uh, uh, evolutionists love to use these hox genes as uh, examples that we have common ancestry. 
Uh, for instance, you can take the uh, gene from a uh, mouse and uh, put it in the right place in the genome in a fruit fly and cause that fruit fly to develop an eye uh, on its leg, while that same gene will cause the development of the eye in a mouse. Mm -hmm. And hence, we've got a great deal of similarity here, and similarity uh, supports common ancestry. I think we need to keep that in mind. On the other hand, it is not as strong an argument as you might think at first, because uh, you'd think that any intelligent uh, designer would not design a different system to produce the same structure in different organisms. <coughs> it, uh, if evolution wants to use that argument to the extreme, it uh, uh, seems to ignore the fact that uh, it would be so much more difficult to design uh, different systems for everything when you've already got a system that works. If you're developing different kinds of organisms, why not use similar systems if you have them? Let me follow up. Uh, that, to me, is one of the strongest arguments for design. The fact that the regulatory genes, not the structural genes, are much more similar between groups that are very different because a regulatory gene is able to regulate. What it regulates is a bit more detail. But the, the great, much greater similarity in regulatory genes between insects and, and mammals is, uh, I think, of one of the best arguments for design. Yeah. You're saying they should have changed over evolutionary time? Pardon me? You're saying they should have changed over evolutionary time? Not necessarily. That is, that's one I mean, it, they could have. According to the evolutionary scenario. Yeah, but to me, uh, it, to me, the regulation of gene expression is a more common feature than the detailed structures that they regulate. Thus, a designer, in my mind, would conserve that incredible ability to regulate, but focus it through uh, steps in its expression. Uh, comment here just a minute. We want to get your comment for posterity sure. here. Mutations tend to always cause bad things, it seems. Anytime we get a mutation there it, that we see in nature, you end up with something negative. Um, that in general, it seems that way, at least when in, in science, when, when someone makes a mutation. And of course, the evolutionary idea is, is that, well, then all the mutations, they, only the good ones come and move Right, forward. right. What, uh, again, how do you respond when, like in the example you just gave, Dawkins uh, just pushes away any idea that there is any design, but that Again, mutations and the central dogma is correct, and you're just describing here how that they're ignoring what is in, in the literature and still moving forward like, like zombies. And even the idea with the paleontologist who says the 12-winged 12 12 dragonfly and doesn't bring, I presume, doesn't have any fossil evidence, even though it's a paleontologist. Well, that's exactly right. There's no, so, uh, there are no fossil 18-winged <laughs> dragonflies, as far as I know. Certainly, he doesn't have uh, pictures of them. So how, how does the word get out when you have, you know, 999 scientists looking for evolution and only one creation scientist and then all of the literature going that direction? Well, I guess my answer would be much the same as, uh, uh, as uh, you know, the response to David uh, when he, upon meeting Goliath. You're not going to do it on your own. You know, I mean, we like to think, okay, David had lots of markman, marksmanship practice, but it still, it was a one-shot deal. You know, if he missed, <laughs> he was toast. He was toast. He was gone. Um, and, 
you know, at, at that point, I think you have to rely on God to, to make the openings and to help you with your arguments and to follow through. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't, th I, I think it's a mistake for us to think that somehow we have to be good enough to meet this. That's almost as bad as us saying that we have to be good enough to be righteous in our own strength. Um, you know. I, I would uh, just like to see more science. When we had, when um, there was the debate uh, between, um, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but anyway, it was a big thing on the, on the literature, or in the, on, the, on the video, and. Um, yeah. Oh, what was, what was well, the guy's a, name? Uh, Ham, uh, was it Ham? Yeah, yeah, Ken Ham and Bill Nye. Ken and Bill Nye. Went and Bill it. Nye, I mean, Ken Ham had a lot of things that he could have said, and then he, and, and I believe, you know, he kept going back to the Bible, but he didn't, you know, get back to the roots of how the central dogma is disproved and how that all the different um, uh, reasons for evolution and, and the, against the flood type of thing yeah, there are a lot of expl other explanations, and maybe you have an idea of why. Cause, well, because he tried to stand up. You know, it's interesting because I just uh, this morning watched the tail end last night, the beginning of an argument that got put on YouTube. Um, a creationist that called in, interestingly, using carbon fourteen dating, and I was listening to him and going, "You can do better than this," um, but. Uh, uh, there were two things. One of them is you have to do, have done your homework. Okay, don't ever, don't ever go out there and figure, oh, I can read, you know, three lines of something and, and it will have it made. You really have to understand what you're talking about. And that means that for most of us, we probably shouldn't be trying to do an argument of that kind. And I would go further to say that, you know, if you're not sure, rather than saying, but, you're not taking this into account, but you're not taking that. Uh, go, go and say, well, let's look that up. Study it together. That way, if they uh, approach those conclusions, it will be their own conclusions. See, you don't change people's mind by telling them what they need to think. Mm -hmm. You change people's mind by having them discover what's there. And my, uh, my teacher friend here is nodding. Um, my other teacher friend, no? Yeah. So, so, you know, one of the things we have to get, do is get out of the way or get into the way in a way that allows them to be sharing with us what we're looking at. Let's look at this a little more de deeply. Uh, rather than coming at it from a, I'm going to prove that you're wrong attitude. Um, the second thing I'm going to say is you'd better have thought of and be ready for the argument that will come up every time and that is we just take science. You're taking the Bible. Bible is your authority. Just, uh, Jack wants to say something but just uh, uh, the one big lesson that I think we can learn from the Ham and Nye uh, debate is that uh, it doesn't do much good to talk past each other. These two men were on two different tracks. And, uh, Which means you're going to have to get down and engage them on their track. If you want to talk to scientists, talk science. It's the only language they understand. Right. Uh, there's no point in uh, talking English to a Russian because they don't know what you're talking about. And the same is true if you try and use a, an entirely different basis uh, for your belief uh, when you're talking to a scientist. No, they, they want nature, cause and effect, uh, and that's the only language they're going to understand. Oh. Uh, yes, um, to follow up these preceding comments, uh, it's been fascinating over a relatively long career work, working with seriously talented Adventist Christian young people and watch them deal with these issues. And the, the, the whole discussion has so many possible dead ends and cul-de-sacs 
that we have to understand ahead of time. And I'm going to come at, back to something you said. I don't think you meant it this way, but I took from your comment that about mutations are they're all bad. Oh, without question. Okay. Sure. If that's what you meant, I, I, I back it up. It, it kind of sounded like, well, it, you know, to me, the creator, if he had the foreknowledge, I believe he did, had to realize that these organisms he created would have to adjust to an environment that was far different than he had planned. We don't have evidence for this kind of unexpressed genetic variability stored ahead of time. Some of it's there. So new variability has to develop. It has to be selectable. In other words, I'm, I'm accepting evolution at the level of change to meet new conditions. And I think, is, to back up Ariel's comment, as long as we're dealing, this is good science, and you have a place to come to talk with, uh, to talk with uh, both the non-believer and the skeptical. And of course, it was a skeptical we wanted to deal with. No. Well, again, next week we won't be here. The week after, uh, uh, unless somebody else takes over. Um, and anybody who wants to volunteer, I can volunteer. Uh, the week after, we'll be discussing fossil whales. <laughs>